Oh, folks, it's time to read her again. We looked at uh, how the gospel of Christ can stir up feelings with people. They either want to accept or reject the Savior that died for them on the cross. The Jews first and then for us Gentiles. I was there once myself when I found out about the gospel and I thought, what? Well, then some things started happening in my life and I started thinking more about it and then after a period of a couple years I finally found the truth and I'm glad I did. I wouldn't want to live the way I lived, excuse me, the way I lived in the past. So now we're going to see Paul moving on. And if you're following along, you know that the end is coming near. He's appealed to go to Rome. Whoops, excuse me. I guess we haven't got to that part yet. But he's on his way to Jerusalem right now because he wants to be there for Passover. He's got a vow to fulfill. We pick him up in Ephesus where he experienced the bad part. Remember, he's been three months there preaching in the temple and great things have happened. And then, of course, like everything else, there's a bad line. So we've had the uh, riot in Ephesus where they almost got a hold of Paul. Thankfully, the town clerk, who had some power, finally got a hold of the mob, the crowd, and tanned him down, and he dismissed him. So we're going to pick it up in chapter 20, verse 1. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them, and departed for to go into Macedonia. And when he had gone over those parts and had given much exhortation, he came unto Greece. And there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail to, into Syria, he proposed to return through Macedonia. And there accompanied him into Asia, Soper of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Artistus and Segundus, and Gaius and Derby, and Timothus and Asius and Tychus and Trophimenius. Those are probably not the correct way to say them. Those going before tarried for us in Troche. And as we sailed away from Philippi, after the days of unleavened bread, and came unto them into Troas in five days, we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when our disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Verse 8, And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a window a certain young man named Eucharistics, being fallen to a deep sleep as Paul was long preaching. He sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third floor loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him and embraced him said, Trouble not yourself, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again, and had broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. And they brought up the young man alive, and were not a little comforted. 
and we we us at Essus. We took him in and came to Malactine. We sailed this and came the next day over against Chorus. And the next day we arrived at Samos and Terrell at Trodilium. And the next day we come to Miltus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend time in Asia. For he had hasted if it were possible for him to be Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miltus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know the first day I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you all season. Serving the Lord with all humility of mine and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying and weight of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable and unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that the bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, move me, neither count my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of grace of God. And now, behold, I know that you all among ha I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and unto all the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God which he had purchased with his blood. For I know this, after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw any away any disciples after them. Therefore watch, remember, that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the world of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver, gold, or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to supply the weak to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he thus spoken, he knelt down and prayed with them all. They all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake that sh they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Doesn't sound like a very encouraging pa uh, passage of scripture. So after Paul flees from Ephesus in the riot, he starts heading for Macedonia. And in when he had gone over those parts and had given them much excitation, he came to Greece. Remember, he set up churches 
all over this area. Churches that are huge, that have an impact on that part of the world, industry, clothing, you name it. They had medicines, all kinds of things in these seven big cities, and they're mentioned in the book of Revelation as well, and the end times. Each one of them has, Jesus has a fault with it, all except for one, and a stern warning for all the churches, the cities as well. So he's going back and exhorting these people, encouraging them to keep on going, sharing what he's been through so that they know what to expect and sharing with them not to be afraid because of the Holy Spirit will give them the grace. And there he abode three months. Now this is Greece. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail to Syria, he proposed to return through Macedonia. Good idea. Why would that be? Well, he knows the Jews are waiting for him. They're waiting for him everywhere almost. If he gets on a ship, they probably have contacts to where they could have one of their friends or pay somebody off. And then as they get out to sea, Paul goes to sleep. Overboard he goes. Not a very pleasant thought. They're that mad at him that they want to kill him. And those, and they're accompanying him unto Asia supporter of Berea and of, okay, we won't go through those names. Those individuals are going with him. These going before tarried for us at Troyes, and we sailed away from Philippia after the days of unleavened bread and came unto them to Troyes in five days where we abode seven. Now you got to remember as Paul's traveling throughout his journeys, he always wants to be at the temple or the synagogue for the Sabbath day. All of his journeys, whether it be on ship or on the land, have to get him there to the synagogue. Otherwise he misses out. Verse 7, upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. His usual thing, right? And the uh, breaking of bread, that's either two functions. That's uh, like the night before Jesus died, and it's a love feast. So Paul preached to them, ready to depart on morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together, and there sat in a window a certain young man named Ecatus, being fallen into a deep sleep. And Paul was on preaching. He sank down with sleep and fell down from third loft, and was taken up dead. Now, we don't want to say that Paul was a windy preacher. That's not the emphasis here. This place, this building that they were in, wasn't constructed like most of our buildings. It was, out, I think, clay or sand or something. I've never been over there, so I'm trying to remember some of that stuff. They don't have fans, electricity, air conditioners. Let's say this guy worked all day. 
He goes into this building. There's other people in there. And anytime we get a whole bunch of people together, our body heat combines together and makes the room hotter. So the guys work eight, ten hours. He's in a hot building. What do you think that's going to mix into? This last Sunday when I was in church, the sanctuary was so hot. I was, myself was having a problem staying away. Because when I get hot, I, I don't want to say I pass out, but it's very easy to close my eyes and go to sleep. So this guy falls out of the third floor law and dies. Verse 10, And Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him said, Trouble not yourself, for his life is in him. Wow. Remember, we're still talking about the Paul that God uses to perform miracles. Verse 11, when he therefore was coming up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. Sure, they're comforted. They're probably enjoying knowing that this guy was dead and God brought him back to life through Paul. That would change any of us. We'd be excited. And when we went before to ship and sailed into Assos, they're intending to take in Paul, for so had he appointed minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Asus, we took him in and came to Mytilene. We sailed thence and came the next day against Chaos. The next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Trilogium. The next day we came to Meltus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hastened, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. I think in this place here, if they went to Ephesus, they had to go a longer way around, and Paul didn't want to do that. I think it was because it was winter or something. And from Mildes he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day I came unto Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying, lying in wait of the Jews. All these places that Paul has been. The fear of the Jews is on the back of his mind. Even though God told him, don't be afraid, he has many followers there. It's still, you have to be aware of your circumstances, sensitive to when to know to leave. And there's probably other temptations that Paul had to deal with. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house. In other words, Paul didn't depend on other people to supply his needs. He worked and then he preached from house to house. He didn't take things. He worked. 
testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance, turning around, going away from something that you have been doing and doing better. Complete turnaround. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, now you say, is this his spirit? Or is it the spirit of God? I would say knowing Paul and the way he listened to the spirit of God, it had to be the spirit of God. Because the spirit of God can put you in such conviction and hold your attention to what he wants you to do that you cannot break it. I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing that the things that shall befall me there. Because he knows that he's going to have unhappy, antagonistic Jews. Powerful Jews. Leaders. Save that the Holy Ghost Witnesses in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. He's got that right as we finish out the book of Acts. We will see the affliction that Paul gets. If I memory re remember right, he shipwrecked three times. So many times he was beaten, uh, what, 24 or 25 lashes left for dead yeah the Holy Spirit witnesses in every city saying the bonds and affliction abide me but folks the Holy Spirit will comfort us in those times give us the strength we will not be left alone to go through any tribulation without the boldness of the Holy Spirit living within us. And I believe that from God. But none of these things move me. Neither count I, I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He doesn't even think of his life but to sacrifice for the Lord Jesus Christ. To testify for the power of God within us. That is what he's doing. We shouldn't fear we have the kingdom of God behind us. With God with us, who can be against us? Yeah, they can do some things, but God has us covered. And now behold, I know that you all among who I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. That lays it out plain. He knows that his life is coming to an end. I don't remember how old Paul is around this time period. But he knows his life is going to end. That he's not returning to the churches that he has built up. Verse 26. Wherefore, because of what's said in verse 25... I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. He's done this. He's done the task that Jesus has laid upon him. Now he gives a warning. 28, take heed therefore unto yourselves and unto the flock 
over the which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God, which has purchased with his own blood. And folks, today I see a lot of pastors not feeding their congregation all of the word of God. There's, they're lowering it down. They don't want to disturb people. They don't want to lose people because some of the word in here is hard to take. Some of them are preaching, uh, oh, what it is it, the prosperous gospel, do this and that, and you won't have any problems in life. Oh, gosh. Jesus never promised that. I know many pastors that are afraid to preach the word. They're afraid they're going to lose their position, their church, and rile people up. Our job is to give them not just milk, but meat. This is a warning for not then, but even now. What's going on? Folks, I'm disappointed in some of the churches that I see, some of the names that I've been seeing, that some of these churches, mega churches, well-named pastors, have anywhere from five billion to a hundred million dollars in their church's treasury. Jet airplanes. You can go on the internet and find these rich pastors. What are they doing? Saving up an inheritance? Saving for a rainy day? If all the rich pastors across the world would get together, we would not have anybody going hungry. There would be no poverty. The people wouldn't be living in tents and cardboard. Everything would be taken care of. But no, they've got to have two, three, four jets, a hundred million dollars in their church value. That scares me. For I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And that's what some of these pastors are doing. They're fleecing the flock. I look at these guys that's got all these monies and airplanes, and I'm thinking, you got people that can't even pay their bills sending you money, and you're spending it on this foolish stuff? It really makes me aggravated. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And that's going on too. The truth of the word of God penetrates. It's getting worse and worse every day. Verse 31, watch. Therefore, watch. That's a command, people. Watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. This is what Paul did in those churches when he spent the time. For years he prayed and watched for him and prayed for protection around him from the enemy and, the, and Satan. Watch and remember. And now, brethren, I command you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. That is a very true. Sanctified, filled with the Spirit of God. Put in God's hands, because God is the only one that can handle this. Verse 33, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. 
Some of these rich pastors in this country can't say that because they've got it. I know one pastor, it's even got a Ferrari. $3 million Ferrari or a $300,000 Ferrari. One of those pastors has three or four jets, a hangar, and crew. Verse 34, Yea, you yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. In other words, Paul saying again, you know for yourself how I've worked for my own food, clothing, and place to sleep, as well as those with me. I haven't taken anything from any of you. I've done what I'm supposed to do. Work as well as minister. Verse 35, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring, you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Some of these rich pastors out there don't forgot this part. They're hoarding money, millions of it. I'm sorry if that you seem if I seem to be a little angry. I am. Because of what they're doing, setting on money when there's things that could be done to benefit the kingdom. 36. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. Sorrowing most of all for the words he spoke that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Yes, it is sad that Paul had to go this route, but he certainly has a great reward waiting for him. He certainly did a lot to change men's hearts while he was here alive. He did all he had to do he emptied himself for God. And that is what God is asking us to do. Emptying ourselves for him to other people. It's not riches we're down here for. We're down here to build the kingdom of God. Men, women, children of all races, color. No one is exempt. But to sit there and be like Lazarus and Luke, where the beggar ate from all his thrown away food that he wasted? Oh boy! These pastors that have all this money is going to, like Jesus said to the Pharisees and Sadducees, you already have your reward. And that tells me they're not going to have much in the kingdom of God if they even make it. I don't understand that. People are important. Not money, not material possessions, people, souls. If we don't think about people, souls around us, then God take us now. Stir our hearts up and let's think that souls, people's eternity, is at stake here. Lord, I pray that you would set us all on fire for those who are lost without hope and pray for conviction on those who have so much that they don't give it to others, that you would break them. Break us all, Lord. Bend us all on your, our knees. Have your way with each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.